uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I, I do see a few names here that I don't know. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Tanya Howe, and I manage the uh, digital writing and narrative design program here at Marymount to kind of connect storytelling to technology. Um, it's been around for about three years now. It, it's hard to imagine that, but it's I think that's right. We've had three visiting speakers. So Aria is our third, which is great. Um, and I first met Aria when I was pursuing a degree at Maryland Institute College of Art in data analytics and visualization. And, um, and I'm just really pleased to invite her here as this year's spring speaker. So uh, Aria is a creative technologist and a visual designer at the Dataface, where she creates interactives and data stories of lots of different kinds. Um, she also, I thought would be particularly interesting for our Marymount folks, um, has a background in fashion design, which might appeal to some of our students. So uh, I will let her give you the rest of the story. So uh, welcome, Aria. Thanks, Tanya. Um, so happy to be here and to be here with all of you this morning. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. I prepared a few slides for us. One second here. Make sure all the right windows are open. Let's see. One second. Make sure it's the right one. I think that's the wrong one, actually. One second. It is this one. Okay. Can everybody see my slides all right? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to get started here. All right. So um, like Tanya said, my name is Aria Todd. Um, I am a visual designer at the Dataface. Um, start with the introductory slide I have set up here. Okay, so a little bit about me. So I was born and raised in New York. Um, and my parents are from the Caribbean. So my um, mom is from Antigua and Barbuda, which is a very, very small island um, in the Caribbean that has a very, very small population. Um, and my dad is Jamaican. So um, they came here when they were um, really, really young. So they've been in the US for quite some time and they actually met in college. And um, so my history uh, is pretty, I guess, interesting because I'm a first generation uh, American um, and uh, born and raised in the Bronx, specifically in New York City. Um, so I feel like that has given me a lot of like well-rounded background is a lot of like culture here is a lot of like interesting things to do um so also um I like as I was coming up and stuff I always had like a passion for creative endeavors broadly um for a long time I knew from a young age like I wanted to do something in a creative field so I explored a lot of things as a kid like um I love to draw I love to like do anything paint my dad is also very creative so I feel like he gave me a lot of the um inspiration to get into creative things so um second here um so I basically just always like have been interested in doing creative things so um on the other side of that I've always had like a passion for technology um like when I was a kid if there was any new computer thing to do I like I had to I had to be involved with it like any of the like I grew up with uh mostly like Windows 95 was probably like the first operating system I used um and it was just really exciting to like do things on like MS Paints and like anything I could just do, like whoever had a computer, because I actually did not grow up with a computer in my household. I had to use like computers in school or um, ones that are my uncles and aunties houses and stuff. So anytime there was a computer present, I had to get on it and had to do something on it. So that was kind of like how I got my start in creative things on, on the computer and stuff. So um, a little bit of fun stuff about me, like I'm also really into anime and gaming and I love traveling. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite genres of music is like metal music, which I think is always really surprising to people. Um, but yeah, it's like, I really love like really intense and cool things, I guess, like broadly for um, 
just generally. And I also love to travel. So uh, the picture that you can see on this slide is from when I went to Toronto back um, last November, and I went to the art, the art um, gallery, Art Ontario, and also like it was a really cool exhibit with like this. It was like a fully mirrored room where you could just like stand and all these like orbs were surrounding you. I thought it was really cool. Um, and when I travel and stuff, I love to like explore different cultures and like see what there is to see and like everything. And also eat a lot of great food because I love food. So that's like a little bit about me broadly. So now I'm gonna get into things about my career journey. So like Tanya was saying, I have a background in fashion design um, and I pivoted to data viz, like kind of, I guess I want to say sort of by accident um, is really interesting. So I did fashion design for many, many years. Like I went to high school fashion industry. So imagine me doing studying fashion design all the way from ninth grade all the way up into the end of college so that is like I don't even know how many years but um it was really it was really cool I was really passionate about it um when I first got into it but as I got into the industry itself I started to feel a little bit disillusioned by it I specialized in children's wear which was really fun and really interesting but the industry itself, like in practice, there was just a lot of like, unfortunately, there was some toxic work environments I was in. Um, and there was some sort of, there was some like ethical questions I had about the industry as a whole, um, which kind of like made me fall a little bit out of love with it. Even though I'm really, really passionate about fashion, like currently, like I still do a little bit of it on the side as like sort of a side gig, but just like, for my own creative purposes and less for like business and, you know, it being my full-time career. So I ended up changing paths because I just felt like if something wasn't working for me, it was best that I just change and move on to something different instead of like trying to justify staying on the same road forever. So I sort of just like jumped into a career in technology. So I ended up quitting my fashion job um, at the end, actually it was the beginning of 2020. So you can, you can see that was, that was an interesting time to be changing careers completely. So um, I got in the boot camp. Um, it was a UX boot camp with CUNY TechWorks. Um, I was really lucky because it was a free program, which is really hard to find <laughs> things like that in New York that are free. Um, so I got I got really lucky when it came to that. Um, so the course started, it was an in-person course that I started in February of 2020. You can imagine after we were all in class together, I met a lot of really great people that are still my friends to this very day. The pandemic hit, everything went remote. I had to start like doing everything that I was set out to do all from the comfort of my own room. Um, and of course it was pretty scary and uh, pretty intense, but um, you know, I just had to sort of like run with it. So after I graduated the boot camp, I was on my job hunt for like eight months. Like it was, it was pretty tough um, being someone new in the tech field. Um, I had to do a lot. I did a lot of like volunteer projects and like anything I can do to sort of like get experience um, was like paramount for me in the beginning. So um, at the, I think it was the beginning of 2021, um, I started interviewing again. I started getting a few callbacks and things from people and um one of my interviews, of course, was with the data face. And thankfully, I was able to start working there at, um, it was April of 2021. So um, it's almost two years that I've been working at the data face. And I will start a little bit about that, like in a second. Um, but it was just really, the journey was really intense. And I didn't really expect everything to go the way that it did when I first started out. But I was really happy in like how it turned out in the end. So 
brings me to my next slide. Uh, working at the database. So what's it like working at a data visualization and storytelling agency? So first off, I want to like preface it to say, I didn't really know anything about data visualization when I first started my job. Um, not that I didn't know anything, of course, like I was aware of like, you know, your standard bar charts and line graphs and things like that. But more the more complex sort of things about like taxonomies and chart types and stuff I did not know a lot of that stuff out the gate but I'm the type of person who when I'm given a challenge I just want to like overcome that challenge like whatever it takes so I think like it was super important to me to just like get into it and start like just getting my hands dirty and like figuring it out as I go. And I'm really, really thankful to like my coworkers. Some of them actually are in the room right now. Um, we're so like patient with me and willing to teach me stuff along the way. And I was able to grow like super rapidly just by being on the job and learning and doing like in action, like day by day. So I'm really thankful that I had like really, really great a really really great team to like help me through and now I just feel like it, it's just amazing when I look back and think about how far I've come and how natural um, the data world has become to me it just feels like it just feels like something that's just a normal thing that's just I just know how to do because it's because of the great team I was able to work with I've been able to work with so um a question I get asked a lot from people, especially like um, I talk to a lot of people who are also trying to get into the field and um, they always wonder, I guess, with like my background and everything, like how technical you have to get to be in this role. So it's interesting because I think a lot of times people think they have to do everything on their own. And I've learned, especially through um, working with the team I've worked with, that you don't have to, you just shouldn't be expected to do every single thing by yourself. Like you could have strengths in more so like me, I'm more strong in design, but maybe I'm a little bit less technical because I'm at my core, I'm like a designer. But um, just to kind of like harken back to like my childhood for a minute, like I was one of those kids who built um my space layouts for my friends back in the day like I would it's so funny like I remember like exchanging like snacks and stuff at lunch in exchange for like making layouts for my friends so that was like my first like foray into coding and like I didn't even know it was coding at the time which was kind of funny so I I just was basically taking layouts and stuff from like they had like layout websites, you could grab the code. And then I'm like, oh, if you change this line of code, this happens. If you do this, that happens. And I didn't, I didn't really think I was doing anything. <laughs> I just thought I was like messing around online, like all kids do, but it really like laid the groundwork for like layout design and web design and even more like technical things when it comes to like data visualization that even though I'm not, like, I don't really know how to write I, I know how to write like HTML, CSS, basic stuff, but JavaScript can be a little bit more tricky for me, even though there's things that I, I'm trying to learn slowly but surely. But um, yeah, I think like as long as you, like when you're working, you have people that will support you through all the things that you might lack and also leveraging things like no code tools. Like I really love no code tools like raw graphs and flourish and for building websites I love using webflow for instance and having things that kind of like bridge the gaps between being super technical and really creative those are my favorite things so it just kind of like gets like gets rid of the gray area like you could kind of dip and dabble into more technical things even without like having to you know, completely have a full grasp on all the nitty gritty details. Um, and something else that I think is really important is like growing your skills. 
Um, so right now I'm taking a data analytics course with Coursera, the Google course, and slowly but surely, it's, it's been taking me a while, but slowly but surely I've been like chipping away at each section, learning things like SQL and learning how to use Excel and Google Sheets, um, writing like formulas in Google Sheets and like cleaning data and all the things that I did not know when I first started this job and just having like having an opportunity to continuously learn I think is like the most important thing like you just well it would just like grow so much if you're always like keeping an open mind to learning more things constantly so that's sort of like the attitude that I have um so I feel like you don't have to know everything there is to know about data visualization everything there is to know about like coding to be like good at what you do. Um, I also really enjoy, and I, I should, I was going to mention this before. I also really enjoy writing like as a hobby. So it kind of like goes hand in hand with the work that I do day to day. So um, like, I'm not like a, like a copywriter, like by trade in any way, but um, I love like writing blogs on medium about like design and data and things like that. Um, and the industry broadly. And I've always been someone who just would write for the sake of writing. Um, so I think having that desire and skill like pairs well with like the more creative and technical things. Like you kind of just have to be very, very well-rounded. And that's another reason why I love working at an agency, especially the agency size that I'm in is very small. So I get to work on a lot of different things. Sometimes I do hop in and try to write some copy here and there for websites and projects that we do. And sometimes I hop into raw graphs and like put the data in from a spreadsheet and just like manipulate it and work with it. And it's just great when I feel like I'm empowered to do those things on my own. And then my team comes in and helps me where I might be a little bit confused or like if I don't understand why, uh, for instance, like, oh, why is this data like looking this way that I set up the the spreadsheet correctly when I was putting the data into like the, uh, like a no code tool, um, what's happening. And then, you know, my teammates can just hop on a Slack huddle with me and walk me through stuff. And that's just, it's just awesome. And I, I really, really love that about um, my team. So let me also preview some projects that I've worked on. So pretty much anything interactive are my favorite things to do. Like I do some static data visualization work sometimes as well, but um, I think my favorite projects are the ones that I get to do anything interactive. So interactive maps, um, things that move on the screen and change when you change different filters and stuff, like those are my favorite, favorite projects to work on. So the two I have here on the screen, um, one of them is Qualified Immunity by uh, Campaign Zero that we did uh, last year, I believe. Um, so I actually, this was one of the first projects I sort of crafted the design narrative, like the color scheme and the typography um, and like the sort of layout of the website broadly. Um, so that was really exciting. And um, my awesome, awesome developers at my, um, agency like built it out and it's like amazing and it's one of like the my favorite things that we've worked on um another project was um more than fair uh by upstart um it's a client and that one was really cool because it was all about like equity in and fairness in lending so like also in addition to just being able to build awesome interactive experiences i also really really enjoy Data, working with data that's like impactful for society, like uh, social impact projects, like financial fairness and equity, like those are just two examples, but like sustainability and just making like data like as accessible as possible for people, all that stuff is like really, really important to me, um, especially like with the More Than Fair project, like I loved it because it was like pushing for equity for underserved communities. Um, in the financial realm. And that's something that's really important to me as somebody who comes from a fa family of immigrants and have seen like 
people being underserved by like the finance finance industry as a whole in a lot of different ways. So um, it's just cool to be able to work on projects that like I feel a, a direct impact in my life or are really important to me. And here's a couple more. I also have more slides and screenshots from the Qualified Immunity Project here as well. But um, another one I worked on that was really exciting was the Status Index of 2022. And I also worked on the Status Index website. Um, and it was also a PDF, a data report that went with it too for both years. I worked on that as my first project when I first started working at the industry, which was literally me being thrown in and saying, okay, it's time to do the thing. And it was super scary. And it was really difficult the first time around because it was my first project on at working at the agency. But the second year I worked on it, it was like, it felt so, that was like when I started to notice like, oh, it felt so natural to sort of just like jump into the process and start working with the data. And of course my awesome teammates, like, always very supportive in anything that we're we're doing and I never feel like I'm like alone <laughs> in anything so um status index basically um just to give a little um background on the project um it brings a awareness towards of attitudes towards Asian Americans like Asian American stereotypes and like the violence that was happening um last year and then during the height of the pandemic so it was basically um we designed a microsite and a PDF report um, with the survey results that detailed all of these different aspects of um, the what may be causing and leading to um, violence um, in the Asian American community. So that project with, was with Launch and TAF. Um, those, those are the clients that we worked on for this project. And it was another one of my, my favorite projects. Like aesthetically, it felt very strong and impactful and the data is really important. So um, I, I just really, really love like working on things that are making an impact in the community. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit on that. And lastly, I also enjoy working on projects that are really fun. So um, the first one here is a Yelp. It's a 10 years of Yelp's top 100 places to eat. Um, that project was super, super fun because it's just categorizing all of these different restaurants and food data. And like I said before, I love eating and I love like traveling and eating at different places all over the country and all over the world. So getting to work with like fun data, like restaurants and like rankings and seeing different food categories and stuff like that is always like super, super fun. Um, so that's like a little bit more of the lighthearted side of what I get to do. Um, another project I really, really enjoyed working on was for Instacart, which was, um, did anyone actually cart that food talk recipe, which was uh, categorizing all these different um, TikTok trends for food and if they were impacting like Instacart's sales for different food items or different like recipe items for those particular TikToks. Um, that one was super fun. And um, I really love working with Instacart specifically because the data is always really fun and um, they're brand um, is very, the brand guides and the color scheme and everything is always super fun to work with. So I really enjoy doing work that's like a little bit more particular for just like fun things. And I think that's like the beauty of working at an agency is that you get to work on so many different types of things. Like it's, it's like the sky's the limit. And we can also like as a team pick and choose like the projects that we want, um, things that we feel strongly about or like align with our values as a company and as people. And it's just like, you really, it's just really amazing to just have so many different things to work on. And um, I know there's another sort of like an aside to this is I know a lot of times, especially in early career, early career designers, there's like this question of if, oh, should I work at a large tech firm? Should I work at like an enterprise company or should I work at an agency? And I feel like sometimes agency work can get a bad rap because it feels like it's 
I've heard from like, it could be like seen as inferior to working at like a larger tech firm or working on enterprise software or something like that. But I feel like it's just like the best way to grow because you get to do so much. And especially if you work on a smaller team, because if you're working at a larger firm, sometimes you can kind of, your design work and your narrative work can get very lost in like the noise. And maybe there are a lot of things that don't get to get shipped or don't see the light of day, even if you worked on it for a year, which is like the worst case scenario. But what I really love for me is that I get to work on something new like every six weeks or so every couple months like there's something brand new to work on and there's like multiple things to work on like I can be working on two and three different projects and jumping between them during the week and that flexibility and that ability to just like maximize my uh, maximize my um work and like the work things I get to work on it's just been really fulfilling for me um broadly so um like if I had to give any advice it would it would be like I, I just really enjoy agency work um because because of everything I just said but um you know I think it's worth like exploring options and seeing what's out there and um also it's cool with an agency like even if you don't specifically work for a very large name tech firm you can also do projects for them if you work you can work with them through the agency even if you're not working with them directly so it just it allows you to add a lot of different brands to your repertoire and also like getting getting um what's the word getting like um experience in um working with a lot of different clients and that that only helps you grow like significantly grow so um yeah that's like my my sort of like reasoning for loving agency work so much and um I would definitely advise it as something especially for students or people looking to maybe change change over to something new like it's always it's always great to see like what what opportunities are out there, even if you least expect, least expect to be where you're going to be. Um, because again, like I didn't really know and didn't think I was going to be specializing in data visualization in my work day to day. But um, I think I've grown to just like really be obsessed with it and <laughs> a little bit healthy obsession, of course. And um just always seeking ways to improve on my craft and grow. So thank you, everybody. Um, I have a couple of things here at my portfolio. Um, I also write on Medium and you can also find me on Twitter and hope maybe at some point I can like drop some of my links into the chat. Um, but yeah, I'm open to any questions that any, anyone might have and with the remaining time. Thanks, Great. Thank you so much, Aria. This has been really exciting. And I know that we have a few students in uh, the Zoom, so I'm hoping that they might be thinking of some questions to ask our speaker, especially since she was talking about, you know, the uh, sort of the job um, process, right? And that sort of employment um, narrative that she shared with us. So, uh, so I think that might be really interesting to a few folks. Um, we did have a couple of questions popped in the chat, and uh, so I want to go back to um, something that um, Diane Murphy asked. Diane, do you want to ask your question, or do you want me to ask it for you? I can ask it. Okay. No, I'm I'm from the other perspective here, uh, Aria. I'm my people. Uh, my students are all technical people, right? So what advice would you give them uh, from the creative side and what they need to think about? They know how to do all the tools and everything, but how, how do you inspire that creativity in them? That's a really, really great question. And I think if I had to give any advice, I would say like the first thing would be to always, always like seek out inspiration in places that you don't really expect it um, and be really, really open-minded to trying out different things. Cause I, I, 
I really love like more technical things, but like I sometimes I see there's like maybe like a disconnect between the two at some time. But then I've also observed people who are extremely technical, but also highly creative, even if they don't actually know they are. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's really important to like ex just push on um, the student to explore the different like realms of creativity, maybe things that they least expected or what they don't usually do. Um, I think also a really, really good thing to do is just to kind of like draw things, like kind of like take out a piece of paper. And I, you know, I didn't really speak to this too much in the presentation, but beyond like all the sort of getting into a tool and working with something immediately, even like jumping in a design tool and working with things immediately in data, I think a really important first step is just to take out a piece of paper and just start drawing things out. Like, even if like a lot of people say, oh, I can't draw, I can't, like, it's not going to be nice, it's going to be ugly or something, and people feel really insecure about that. Um, I would still push people to just do it anyway. Like, even if it's not good, just like do it anyway. And you might surprise yourself and see like, oh, I can actually like form ideas just by just drawing it out and not getting too bogged down with maybe they don't know how to use design tools. They don't know how to use like Figma or Adobe Illustrator or whatever to sort of create um, things. But I think just starting out with a piece of paper drawing and just like opening horizons beyond that of just the more technical things, which can be really amazing, but sometimes the, te the technology can box you in too, because yeah. there's like constraints um, to all different types of things. And you might not realize like a certain thing that you can do because you're kind of like, well, the tool doesn't do that. So I guess I won't do it. And it's, it's sort of like stopping you from exploring and growing. And, um, and I guess one other thing I could say about that too, is like, partner like for more technical people to partner with creatives because I think there's a lot for more technical people to learn from creatives and vice versa because I really love for instance working with people who are more development minded and more technically engineering minded because they'll mention things to me that I would have never thought and or like you know maybe provide a constraint that I didn't think was there as a designer I'm like kind of like free flowing and just doing whatever um, and maybe vice versa as a creative person, I'm opening up like horizons for a more technical person. I was like, oh, I never really thought of it that way, but you wouldn't get that unless like those two worlds kind of merge and everyone's sort of talking and meshing with one another. Cause I feel like sometimes there's like this designer and then like developer silo that can happen where everyone kind of like stays on their side of the line. And I think the beauty really happens when everybody just comes together and learns from one another. Yeah. Thanks. That That's a really, really good point. Diane, I, I'm, I'm interested in um, your thoughts about that. What do you, does it make sense to you as a, as a tech person? Uh, yes. Uh, as I said, uh, I, I think part of it, as you said, was um, the quality of what you do might not be what you would expect uh, a more creative person to do right uh, uh, so again so that inhibits you from even trying right and so you know it's this whole idea of um, getting people to free draw and do things and then realize that you know particularly in, in today's world with uh, cartoons and all these other things right we, we don't actually have to have exactly the same image as you know the real world right and, and, and to me, it's that whole idea of imagining something that's representative of something, but not necessarily the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Aria, kind of leaping off of that, I know that there are a couple other questions in the chat, um, but I was uh, interested in the way that you, because this, I think, ties into what, um, what Diane was asking about. Um, what do you think the role of narrative is and storytelling is in... Um, you know, in bringing your visions to life, but also in terms of that collaborative work that you were talking about with uh, with technologists on the one hand and coders and, you know, the folks in the development side of things. Yeah, that's a great question. So I, it's really interesting because I feel like when it comes to like narrative stuff, I feel like everyone on my team is sort of 
jumps in to help with that. So like a like a first step that we often do, like in usually in Figma, we'll jump into like a sort of like more word based, like linear word based, like written text of this all of the ideas that we will have. And we'll just kind of like write it out, write it out. So like, I think after it's kind of like it can one can, can come before the other, but sometimes like you draw something first and then you craft a narrative around it. Or sometimes you're given the narrative by a client already and you just sort of have to work with what you got. But sometimes it's not always that clear and just sort of like literally just writing everything out, even if it's not like perfected and maybe accompany that with some drawing and it jump back into writing things and just sort of like putting things on the page and whatever way possible. That And that could be like in a Google doc. It doesn't even have to be anything super formal. Um, and like let other people read through it. Like I think um, another important thing with the collaborative aspect of that is like working out loud or like working in front of people and not being afraid of people seeing like things that are half done or half like half baked. And I, that's been like really eye opening for me or just like great for me in general because I'm I don't feel worried for any of my teammates to like come into a file like halfway and see a, it's still a messy like a little bit messy and they might have an idea or something that they'll throw in to just a text or like the brainstorming document that we have going and I'm like oh I would never have thought to do that or oh and then it kind of sets it sets like these angles flowing from thing to thing that you may not expect and Things are all, I feel like things are always better when you have more minds at work, just sort of adding to the story of something and like crafting the narrative around like specific data. You know, like I said, like sometimes your client gives you something, but maybe it's not quite what like what works because as, um, you know, as data storytellers in our agency, it's like, okay, we've been doing a lot of this work for a long time. And sometimes we take the liberty of like, oh, did you consider this angle or that angle? Um, and sometimes um, I know, for instance, like with the client, um, do like different brainstorming things that involve the client too, like have them put in their ideas, have us put in our ideas, and it kind of all just comes together into this sort of like mix of things until you iterate on it and iterate on it again, change, cut, review until you end up with something nice. Yeah. Trust the process, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, Sue, you had a question for Aria. Do you want to ask? Sure. Uh, Aria, I, I love your designs. First of all, they're really engaging. Um, I actually teach HTML and CSS and it, 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 it captures uh, students both in the technology area, but also uh, liberal arts in all sorts of areas, right? Because web is important. And I'm, you know, the tools that you, like the Webflow, um, WordPress, you know, the, the I, I want to call them form-based tools. Um, um, they're great, but do you still, do you still see a role for uh, HTML and CSS knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, at the end, like at the end of the day, like all the tools are like based on like without HTML, CSS, like those tools wouldn't really exist. Right. Too. So it's like underneath under the hood, like that's really what's going on. And um, for instance, specifically, I think my knowledge of HTML, and CSS is what allowed me to jump into these tools and work a lot faster because I kind of I already knew what was going on beyond just like dragging and dropping it's like kind of just having that background of oh this is why you should organize your um like in Webflow for instance like they have classes that you put for different things and it, it's the same thing as like CSS classes and like knowing having that knowledge like allows you to just sort of like you jump in a tool like that and it's like, oh, I already know what's going on here. It's not just like, it's not like a mess of confusion. Things aren't happening by magic. It's it's still like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript under the hood. So um, I think it's really important to still um, have that knowledge. And there are certain things like Webflow is great. I love Webflow, but or any even like WordPress. I've used WordPress for like my portfolio and things like that. But there are certain still certain limitations that you can't really get with just those tools alone. Like for instance, um, for the status index, 
Um, that was built in Webflow, but the data visualizations were built in Svelte. Mm -hmm. So there was, we had to like, um, I think it's iframe them into the um, Webflow layout. So there was no way to do that as dynamically having interactive data viz into like a Webflow um, basic page without using JavaScript and specifically in this case felt. So um, I think I think magic really happens like when you can leverage whatever you know how to do. Like it could be HTML, CSS, JavaScript, no code, all those things. I still feel like they have a place in um, the current tech landscape. Great. Thank, thanks. That's that's encouraging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, Aria, Matt had to leave to go to another Zoom meeting, but <laughs> but he had a, a really good question and I wanted to have an opportunity to hear your thoughts about it. Um, he asks, uh, you know, how valuable do you think it, he's a sociologist, right? Oh, so he's wondering how valuable you think it is for people in your position uh, to have a really solid theoretical foundation about the social or political issues that clients work on. Yeah, that that is a great, great question. Um, wow. So I'm thinking about sociology. So like um, specifically for um, UX, like since I, I took my my boot camp was specifically in UX design and I just find found myself specializing. But I think it's like having the awareness and like social awareness to know that because a lot of a lot of times I think like there is maybe a misconception by designers that the things that they design can't hurt or harm because they're just designs like oh I'm just designing and that is far as the farthest thing from the truth um so there is so many reasons why having like a background or understanding and like empathy for people broadly um understanding of like broader social issues um because design can be very very powerful and like more powerful than people um may believe and everything around us is designed um even the things that might do harm <laughs> to people are also designed so i think it's really probably like even more important than some of like the more you know, knowing certain technical things or knowing how to use certain tools. But if you like have an understanding of people and people's problems and just like, just being a very, just having a sense of awareness, not to um, design things in a way that prevent people from doing things they need to do or spreading misinformation or, um, I mean, there's so many, so many things that could go wrong with, with things on online these days, especially these days. So yeah, I feel like having an understanding of that as your baseline, uh, also reading a lot of books, like um, there is a book that I really, really think is important for a lot of designers to read. It's called Ruined by Design by Mike Monterio, I believe is the author's name. Um, that book changed my whole perspective on the design industry broadly. And there's like a lot of things that maybe if you're starry eyed and maybe because I kind of come from a fashion background where I saw like the kind of the underbelly of why like things are not quite right. It sort of made me be a little bit more skeptical when it comes to like my design work now. And then just continuing to broaden my knowledge of like social problems and societal issues. And another really great book to just to, when on the topic of books is um, uh, there was another one that I read recently, uh, Weapons of Math, Math Destruction. Yeah. yeah, that one, that one was another like eye opener as well. And um, there's a few others, like I have like a whole list, but like there are a lot of books that really like changed my perspective on the design world for, for better, or for worse. But I think having that awareness is, is really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. I posted uh, to the chat, a Goodreads list um, about uh, of books that are about kind of digital inequity, algorithm bias, and so on. A lot of the things you've mentioned are 
are on there. Um, so, we, and I, I don't think it's just the design a- aspect, right. That can be, that can be dangerous, right. Without that knowledge. I think it's also the coding side of it, right. Yeah. How you organize data, how you clean it, how you, you know, how you understand that data, what historical kind of narratives you're drawing into that data. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important. And um, yeah, so thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're working with like, data sets and things, especially demographic data, you don't want to like skew information for people to take the wrong, I say wrong in quotes, but like the unintended um, like inferences from how you're presenting information. So I think that's also like, especially in the day-to-day work I do, extremely important. Like you don't want to like, um, you know, like the really egregious examples of like showing, I think there's one um, big no-no, like showing migration patterns or people who are like escaping like war or poverty and showing it as like a big red line that's like kind of going into another country. That's like one of the things I think about the most, like it looks like an invasion or something negative when people are just escaping hardship. Like you wouldn't want to present that information in a way that makes people think it's something negative. Right. Yeah. And things like understanding, um, you know, proportion versus raw numbers, right? Mm. On a basic, a basic level. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. Are there any other questions that folks have for Aria? Anything from our students? Okay. Well, um, if that if that's all, then I'll, I'll ask everybody to join and you know a round of applause and and thank you, Aria, for um, for spending time with us this morning. And uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, we do have the video. Um, and Aria has has happily let us uh, record this. And uh, and if she agrees, you know, I can distribute it to to folks who may have um, you know an interest in seeing the remainder of the uh, mm-hmm. the talk. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks to everybody who came today and, uh, and yeah, I'll hope to see you all in the future and another one of these, maybe. Thanks so much. Thanks Thanks, everybody. Take care.